all right welcome back to the channel warhammer man back in the studio and we are officially getting hit with the codex eldari update so this is obviously going to be the faq essentially update for the most recent codex uh, it is uh april 13th 2022 which is today and uh, we already know a couple of things we're inspecting expecting inside of there uh, but gonna take a look and see exactly what has changed and hopefully they've made the correct corrections or the appropriate corrections uh, that being said make sure to like and subscribe for warhammer 40,000 kill team necker monday age of sigmar war Cry. content news reactions reviews you know painting tutorials pretty much anything to do with the hobby so uh, let's take a look at our uh, codex eldari errata all right so here we have the codex eldari indominus version one and obviously it is april 13 today and uh, that is the date of this these documents collect amendments to the rules and present our responses to players frequently asked questions often these amendments are updates necessary necessitated by the new release of community feedback at the other times the amendments are errata designed to correct mistakes or add clarity to a rule that is not as clear as it might be updates and errata page 92 the yanari add the following bullet points after the fifth bullet point for the purpose of strands of fate abilities harlequins and drukari units included in the yanari detachment are considered to have the asuryani keyword so basically if you're going to take the yanari it allows you to do drukari and harlequins mixed in together and it's not going to invalidate your ability to take strands of fate but the strands of fate are still only going to apply to units that have the strands of fate special rule so you're not going to be able to use the strands of fate on units that don't have that keyword uh, but it's not going to stop you from using it on your mixed items from the aldari codex uh, that do have that keyword for instance so that's a clarification not a bad idea page 97 malicious frenzy change the second sentence to until these attacks are resolved each time a model in that unit makes an attack an unmodified hit roll of six automatically wounds the target so makes sense basically just clarifying that this is not like an indefinite ability that's just during like the current phase until you resolve your attacks page 120 psychic disciplines change the second sentence of the second paragraph to if that psyker is an in Rathe unit instead replace all instances of craft world asuryani core keyword on the psychic power if any with author asur <laughs> in Rathe keyword and all instances of the craft world asuryani character keywords on the psychic power if any with the in Rathe character keywords so basically just clarifying that uh you know you're still able to use it on your in Rathe units but only your in Rathe units page 131 psychic fortitudes collective denial delete the last sentence of this ability page 143 strands of fate change the first sentence to if every unit from your army has the asuryani keyword and is drawn from the same craft world excluding units with the phoenix lord and rathe are unaligned keywords when the start of each battle round you can make a strands of fate roll so i think the main thing there is like phoenix lords and the avatar obviously don't prohibit you from using this but obviously in rathi as he, as well uh, if you were to take a small contingent of them like in a patrol or something like that if every unit from your army has the asuryani keyword so the weird thing about this is the harlequins have the asuryani keyword i can't remember let me check really quick All right, so they do not have the Asuryani keyword. So if every unit in your army has the Asuryani keyword and is drawn from the same craft world, excluding units with the Phoenix Lord and Rathay and unaligned keywords, then at the start of each battle round, you can make a Strands of Fate roll. So if I'm not mistaken, this is prohibiting you from having Strands of Fate and Luck of the Laughing God at the same time. And then it says for the next one, page 144, Luck of the Laughing God, Change the first sentence to, if every unit from your army has the Harlequins keyword and is performing the same Sadath, excluding units with the Solitaire or Honor Line keyword, then at the start of each battle round, you gain a number of luck rerolls, depending on the size of the battle you are playing, as shown below. So if I'm not mistaken, this is stopping you from being able to have Strands of Fate and Luck of the Laughing God in the same army. Which 
which I mean I don't disagree with. Definitely do not disagree with that because it's too powerful to have both of them, obviously. Because it currently says, let's look at the current iteration and kind of compare it. 143, Strands of Fate. It currently says, if every unit from your army has the Asriani keyword and is drawn from the same craft world, excluding models with Enrathe and unaligned keywords. So they added in Phoenix Lord. Then at the start of each battle round, you can make a Strands of Fate roll. Hmm. So they really just added in Phoenix Lords there. That was really the only thing that changed. And then for the luck of the Laughing God, uh, change the first sentence to, if every unit from your army has the Harlequins keyword, if every unit from your army has the Harlequins keyword and is performing the same Sadath, excluding units with the unaligned keyword. So they added in Solitaire. Then at the start of your battle round, you gain a number of luck rerolls, depending on the size of the force. Hmm, so maybe I'm wrong there. Maybe they're literally just adding in Phoenix Lord and Solitaire, and you can still have both. That just seems too much because if you're playing a game and you have a mixed Eldari army and basically you're taking like an Eldar army, let's say, like the main Eldari army, and then you're adding in. So he has Asria. Yeah, I mean, if you're adding in uh, like a patrol detachment of Harlequins to your army. You're going to potentially have all your strands of fate dice plus luck of the laughing god dice as well. That just seems too powerful. That's so many like flat numbers and rerolls. I mean, even if you don't take any chances at all in a 2000 point game, you're getting four luck of the laughing god rerolls. And then on top of that, you're rolling six strands of fate dice and keeping four of them. So you basically have like eight extra manipulations of the dice roll minimum. You know, maximum, you can have way more than that. So I don't know. That seems just ridiculously powerful. Maybe I'm misunderstanding that. Or that would have been a good clarification for them. I mean, but the way this is described. The Sadeth keyword. Yeah, I mean, there's just not really that much to it. If every unit from your army has the Harlequin's keyword and is performing the same Sadeth. See, so you should only get Luck of the Laughing God because it says army has the Harlequin's keyword. So if you have a mixed army, there's no way you should be getting Luck of the Laughing God dice. So I think some people have been playing that wrong. Because I have seen mixed armies and they're using both. And then for Strands of Fate, it says, if every unit from your army has the Asuriani keyword and is drawn from the same craft world, excluding models with the Enrathe or Unaligned keywords, and at the start of each battle round, you can make a Strands of Fate roll. And then obviously they added in Phoenix War Warriors or Phoenix Lords. If every unit in your army. And then let me just check two more things to that. Because this is obviously important for you or an opponent. The keywords on the Harlequins are just Eldari and Harlequins. But Strands of Fate requires Asuriani for you to be able to use it. So if you have any Harlequins in your army, you're technically not eligible for Strands of Fate. Now there is one more rule that goes along with that that might supersede it. Let me go back to the Traveling Players rule and this is again there's the way this book is laid out like it's really good once you get familiar with it but there's definitely a lot to it and there's a lot of rules and if you miss one key rule it can kind of throw everything off so for the Asriani detachment abilities an Asriani detachment is one that only includes models with the Asriani keyword excluding models with the unaligned keyword Asriani detachments gain leaders and warhammer abilities. Craft world units in Asriani detachments gain craft world keywords. 
Troop units become objective secured. Leaders of the Warhost, you can only include a maximum of one Octarch model per Asriani detachment. And then traveling players. If your army is battle forged, one Harlequin's patrol detachment in your army can have this ability. A detachment with this ability is ignored for any mission pack rules that require every unit in your army to have at least one faction keyword in common. And then it says, e.g. Eternal War mission packs. This means that you can, for example, include one Harlequin's patrol detachment as part of an Asriani or Drakari detachment. Now it does not, it says for units... One Harlequin Patrol Detachment in your army can have this ability. A detachment with this ability is ignored for any mission pack rules that require every unit in your army to have at least one faction keyword. But that's just for like mixing army factions. That should not affect Strands of Fate. And then reading on, Harlequin's units within such a detachment are excluded when determining your army's faction. And when determining if every unit in your army has a certain keyword or ability. For example, such units do not prevent other Asriani units from your army from using rules such as Strands of Fate, and do not prevent other Drukhari units from your army from using rules such as Power from Pain. Likewise, such units do not prevent you from using Asriani or Drukhari chapter approved rules, secondary objectives, etc., provided all other units in your army have the appropriate keyword. So you can still use Strands of Fate because of the Traveling Players rule, but you cannot use the luck of the laughing god because there's nothing that says that it overrides the luck of the laughing god everything having to have the harlequins keyword okay so that being said that may not necessarily be specific to this faq but the way that actually breaks down if you decide you want to take an asriani unit uh or an asriani army and then you want to include a traveling player patrol detachment you can still use Strands of Fate. You can't use it on any of the Harlequins, but you don't get any Luck of the Laughing Dice uh, rolls or anything. So that is interesting. Definitely a nice clarification. I was kind of curious how that worked. I have seen a couple of battle reports online, and obviously when a book first comes out, people are going to be making mistakes. But I have p seen people with mixed armies using both those rules. Obviously, you know, after looking at this, that is not legit. So... That's interesting for me to know and then also for you as well. So, you know, obviously if you're playing against someone else with a mixed army, now you know and you know exactly how to point that out. So that is definitely interesting and, uh, you know, good to know for sure. So keeping on here, page 148, 151, and 162, Altark, Janezar, Howling Banshees. Change the first sentence of this unit's Howling Banshee Mask or Terror Lament ability to each time you select an enemy unit as a target of a charge made by the Bearish unit. The enemy unit cannot fire overwatch or set to defend against that charge. So that is an important clarification. Previously, it was if you declare a unit, they can't fire overwatch. Now you have to, they can't fire overwatch for that charge. So if you don't actually make it into combat with them, they're not restricted from overwatch for the remainder of the turn or anything like that. So before there was like kind of some gray area where it was clearly how it was intended versus how it was written. Now, if you declare that unit, they can't fire overwatch or set to defend. If you make it into combat, they're already in combat. So it won't matter if anything else charges afterwards. They wouldn't be able to do that anyway. And then alternatively, if you declare a bunch of units and then you fail to make it into combat, it was only applicable to that first charge. And now they're not in combat. So they can still go back to firing overwatch and set to defend as normal. So they fixed the broken kind of narrative on that. But it was pretty obvious what was intended. So page 150, Baharath, Cloud Strider. Change this ability to once per turn, so not battle round, per turn. When this model consolidates or makes a battle focus move, you can instead remove this model from the battlefield and set it up again anywhere on the battlefield that is more than 9 inches away from enemy models. So that's interesting. Once per turn, when the model consolidates or makes a battle focus move. So you can only ever battle focus on your turn. You could consolidate on both turns. So if you battle focus on your turn, I don't know how you would consolidate afterwards. 
because I don't think you can charge after you battle focus. Can you? Oh, let me check that one out too because that's an interesting one as well. And there's so many just like crazy references and just kind of like sorting through all the new rules is definitely a lot. Definitely a lot. So battle focus. This unit is eligible to shoot in a turn in which it advanced. But if it does so, then the unit at the end of the phase, models in the unit only make attacks with assault or pistol weapons they are equipped with. And when resolving those attacks, this unit is treated as having remained stationary. Okay, so you can battle focus and charge with that. It's only if you make the... In your shooting phase, after the unit has finished making its attacks, unless it fell back or advanced this turn, this unit can make a battle focus move. When it does so, roll 1d6. Each time a model makes a normal move or up to a distance in inches equal to the result, as if it were a movement phase. A unit makes a battle focus move, cannot embark when transports, models in the end of the move, and the unit and the, until the end of the turn, such a unit is not eligible to declare a charge. A unit cannot make a battle focus move if it arrived in reinforcements this turn, and a unit cannot make more than one battle focus move per turn. So the first bullet point of battle focus, you could still use and then charge and then consolidate and potentially use that ability a second time. But the second rule, you cannot make a charge if you battle focus to like get back out of the way versus battle focusing. Man, that's wild. So the first battle focus ability, you can advance use the battle focus special ability but you don't get any extra move off of it the second battle focus ability you move normally shoot and then you battle focus move again okay so that makes sense I see why they clarified that because now you could use Model consolidates or make a battle focus move if you can instead remove the model from the battlefield. So now you can move, use either of the battle focus abilities, and then remove them from the battlefield and set them back up somewhere else. But you could potentially use the first battle focus ability to move, battle focus shoot, and then use the special ability, and then chart, you know, to fly up off the table and then deep strike nine inches away and then charge from the deep strike nine inches away, attack, and then consolidate, and then deep strike again. So now you can only use it once per turn, but you could potentially be using it on your turn and your opponent's turn as well. So that's interesting. I did not actually realize that was a possibility, but uh, that is definitely interesting. I don't think it changes much, though. Uh, so page 163, Striking Scorpion's Warrior Options. Change the first bullet point to a Striking Scorpion Extract Shuriken Pistol can be replaced with the Scorpion's Claw. Okay, so you have to replace your pistol with the claw. So it's one or the other. 167, Warp Spider Flicker Jump. Add the following sentence to the end of this ability. Your opponent can then select new targets for the charge if they wish. So the Flicker Jump allows you the first time you're charged uh, to basically like teleport out of the way. So now your opponent can select a new target if they wish. Support Weapons. Changes the attacks characteristics on the unit profile to 2 and the leadership characteristic to 7. So let's look at those two really quick and see. I am curious about that. So the first time, this is the flicker jump. The first time in each phase this unit is selected as the target of a charge. If the unit is not within engagement range of enemy models, it can make a normal move of up to 6 inches. Until the end of the phase, this unit cannot fire overwatch or set to defend. Okay, so then you make that normal move. Your opponent can choose a new target if they want. And then for the support weapons platforms, they currently have... Okay, this was obviously a mistake in the codex. Uh, so the attacks, we had discussed this previously... The attacks are currently set at 7 for the support weapon, and the leadership is 10. It's obviously supposed to be attacks 2 and leadership 7. So, big change, obviously. Um, and then add the core keyword to the datasheet keyword for uh, page 182 troop. So, that is huge. 
Um, obviously, the Harlequin troops were missing the core keyword. So the bikes have it, but the troops did not. So now the troops have it. They were supposed to have it the whole time. Uh, that is definitely good. So now you have basically your troop or your Skyweavers have the core keyword and nothing else, I don't believe. None of the characters have the core, but a lot of the abilities are, are character or core. So that's definitely how it was intended to be. That is really good for the troops. Now they will be able to use all your core abilities. Previously, it was only useful on bikes and most people weren't taking the bikes. Um, or some people are, but not like the biggest armies. So uh, that is huge. That definitely needed to fix. So page 183, Solitaire Blitz ability. Change the first sentence to once per battle in your movement phase. When this model makes a normal move, it can blitz. So that makes sense as well. Previously, it said once per battle in your movement phase instead of making a normal move. The model can blitz move. If it does so until the end of the turn, add 2d6 to this model's move characteristic and add 2 to the model's attack characteristic. So I think that was just a clarification thing because normally its move is 12. And then it says when this model makes a normal move. So basically it moves 12. It can't. It can only use it on a normal move. It cannot use it on a uh, dash or a uh, advance. So you make a normal move of 12 inches. And then on top of that, until the end of the turn, add 2d6 to its move characteristic. So it would be 12 plus your 2d6. And then you add 2 to the model's attacks characteristic. So again, I think that's more for clarification or to make sure that you can't do that with advancing. Um, and then one, one FAQ, if a player wishes to re-roll a roll that includes a dice manipulated using the Strands of Fate ability, are all the dice for that roll re-rolled? And the answer is yes. And then example, David needs to make a charge roll of 10 or more in order to give himself the best chance of success. He declares to manipulate one of the dice for that roll and then roll the other. Unfortunately, David rolls a 3, so he would have a total of 9. So 6 from the Strands of Fate die and then 3 which he rolled which is not sufficient to successfully charge. Dave then decides to use the command reroll stratagem to reroll that charge roll. When he does so, he must also reroll the manipulated dice. So then he would just roll 2d6 and have to try to get a 10 again. Now, I wish they would have clarified uh, the question about using two strands of face on the same. Because if you have a, a strands of fate roll that you want to manipulate and it's two dice it's not real clear if you're eligible to use two of your strands of fate dice say you want to make a charge and it's a 12 inch charge or a 10 inch charge and you don't want to take a chance can you use two strands of fate sixes on the same charge roll to just make it a 12 without having to roll because it's not real clear how that how that works uh, that was one of the questions i had i would say no you cannot do it but it really doesn't specify it that clearly and I could see the argument for both um, the examples in the book even are kind of like confusing so assuming you rolled your sixes and you saved multiple charges which was the two so now you have a couple charge dice and you're getting ready to make a charge before making a roll of any type shown above for a unit with a strands of fate ability if any of your retained dice have a result corresponding with the type to roll as shown above, and have not been used to manipulate a roll this battle round, you can manipulate that roll. See, so the way it says, if any of your retained dice have a result. So if that type of roll involves 1d6, do not roll a dice, then roll is treated as an unmodified roll of 6. If that type of roll involves more than 1d6, treat one of those dice as an unmodified roll of 6. Then roll any other dice and add up the results. So my inclination is that you cannot use two strands of fate on the same 2d6 dice roll. But I could see how people are arguing that. I've heard it discussed a decent amount. I wish they would have clarified that. But I mean, I still feel like the way it's worded and the way it sounds, because it specifically says if that type of roll involves more than 1d6, 
e.g. psychic test, treat one of those dice as an unmodified roll of six. Do not roll that dice. Then roll any other dice and add up the results as normal. So then if you were like, okay, and then I'm going to use it on the die that I'm about to roll, it would take you back to the initial bullet point, the same bullet point, which says, if that type of roll involves more than 1d6, treat one of those dice as an unmodified roll of 6. So now you replace the other die with the 6. Do not roll that dice, then roll any other dice and add up the results. So it seems like that rule itself prohibits you from being able to use two strands of fate to manipulate the same 2d6 dice roll. But... Again, I wish they would have clarified it, but at this point in time, I'm sticking with my guns on this one, saying that you can only use one. So when it's all said and done, I think the most important thing that we got out of this was basically that the FAQ is good, it's clarifying that. The fixing the Howling Banshee rule or clarifying that is very good. Um, it's obviously luck of the laughing god you know they didn't have um there was issues with like the solitaire thing but i think the core for the troop is huge they obviously needed core and were intended to have core and it was just forgotten and then the support weapon needed to be fixed obviously but it was very obvious what they meant to do there it was supposed to be two and seven um well, I guess we didn't technically know the two, but I think it was pretty obvious what was going on there. It's like two guardians, so I would have thought it'd be two or three. The flicker jump, letting your opponent select a new target, that's big. The Behareth Cloud Strider, you know, there's definitely people that were probably using that twice in per turn. Yeah, I think overall, those were the, I think the most important thing was the Banshee charge. The little FAQ, troop getting the uh, keyword, and then obviously just a couple other little clarifications. But when it's all said and done, I don't think this really changes anything. Uh, there's no real like nerfs here or anything like that. But now granted, this is just a, the updates errata and FAQ. This is not the balanced data slate. So we'll have that coming later on in the week. This is a completely separate document. So that being said, I think this is important. This is technically a buff for Eldar at this point in time because it has buffed Harlequins. So now the troop is actually better than it was before. But I do expect when the balanced status light comes out later this week, that is where we'll see the actual nerf. What do I think it's going to be? Well, I'm not sure right now. A couple things have been discussed and a couple of them made sense. It could go either way. Uh, we'll have to see exactly how they decide to do it. I hope they don't restrict how many units you can take in the army because there's so few selections already. I think that would be a poor idea and make the army nearly unfeelable. I mean, you only have one heavy support. You only have one fast attack. You only have one transport. You only have one troop. You have two HQs and two elites. So, And one of the elites is restricted to one per army already. So any further restriction is, is going to make the army very difficult to field. So I think the best thing to do is to address the issue with points one, which can definitely work. I hope they don't go overboard because, again, you still want to see the army fielded. But I think also possibly changing. The, the biggest thing I've seen so far is if they change the points, that would be a big deal. So say, for instance, the gunboats went up by, let's just say, 10 points. And then let's say on top of that, Say, for instance, they made the Void Weavers cost 10 more points. And then they let's say they made the Prism Cannon, Prismatic Cannon, another 5 points. So if you take the Haywire Cannons, you don't really get the same nerf, but it still gets more expensive. So you go up to 100 or 105. Well, if you're taking now 9 of these in your army, that's 90 points or potentially... Um, uh, 135. So 90 or 135. So that would potentially eliminate your ability to take one of your transports then. Assuming you wanted to keep all nine of the uh, Void Weavers, obviously. So you'd have to take one last transport in your army. And that would be 80 points trimmed off the top. And then depending which one they went for, you'd have to trim out another 10 or another 50. So you'd basically lose one of your troops or like, you know, some war gear or something like that. Just have to trim it up a little. So that would be pretty good, but I don't think that fixes the army. 
I don't think just all of a sudden people are like, oh, now this army's not good anymore because I have one less boat, like one less transport and five less Harlequins or something like that. I don't think that fixes it. I think the real thing they need to do, honestly, and this was, I think, suggested by somebody else in the community. I think for Mirage launchers, each time an attack is made against this model, subtract one from the attack's hit roll, and that attack's hit roll cannot be re-rolled. I think they leave the Mirage launcher as subtract one from the attack's hit roll. And then maybe they do a stratagem for Mirage launchers, like with the Mirage launcher keyword, that is, you know, one command point or two command points if the unit you're using this on has three models. Um, and then that makes it so the attack's hit roll cannot be re-rolled. I think that basically fixes it. So essentially, you have three squads of Star Weavers, and then, or Void Weavers, and then a couple Star Weavers. If you expose one squad of your Void Weavers, and then your opponent tries to shoot at them, you can give them the, no, you can't re-roll anything against this unit. And then protect that entire unit for one or two command points, depending. But then they could potentially shoot at your Star Weavers, still at minus one to hit, but not have that same, you know, no re-rolls. And then obviously because it's a stratagem, you could only use it once per phase. Or alternatively, if you have two of your boat squads of three exposed, you could use it on one, but not on the other. You know, or, you know, obviously if you have all three exposed. I think that would basically fix Harlequins. I think it's a super simple fix that would really make the difference. And even if you decided that, okay, we're going to do that and take away the reroll and then make it a stratagem so it's one if you have one boat in your army or two if you or in your squad or two if you have two or three uh, models in that unit. So now all of a sudden it, it nerfs all the rest of your boats slightly because they lose the reroll, the, the stopping rerolls. And then it also costs you a couple command points. So then I don't think they have to go as hard on the paint points. So then they could almost get away with all Void Weavers costing five more points. And then the Prismatic Cannon costing another five more points. So if you take Void Weavers with Haywire Cannons, they only go up five points apiece. If you take Void Weavers with Prismatic Cannons, they go up ten points apiece. So that adds 90 points to your army. It costs you, you know, potentially two command points per turn to protect your void weavers with the no rerolls and you can only use it on one unit instead of all three units having it plus all your star weavers having it and i think honestly right there the harlequins are fixed i think that's the biggest thing and it's the least amount of damage you have to do to like the field ability of the army it makes it so that you can still strategically position your units and benefit from the stratagem but you have to spend more points on the army and you have to use a couple command points to gain that ability and then now all of a sudden your transports are potentially a little more vulnerable or they are more vulnerable. So I think that balances it. So we'll see what they do. I hope they do something along those lines and they don't go too crazy. I don't want to see Harlequins get nerfed to where people can't use them. I want it to be something where they're still fun. They're just not super ridiculously overpowered. I also think the meta will shift and it's actually going to take some of the steam away from the Harlequins. Uh, so we obviously see the Tyranids Codex coming out. That is going to basically... You know, now all of a sudden a ton more mortal wounds and a lot of just spam firepower, you know, just tons and tons of firepower. That's like the weakness of the Harlequins. So, you know, there's definitely still some protections they have in place, but a bunch of one damage weapons, you know, say 30, 40 shots or something like that, they do one damage. And then all of a sudden you're hitting with 50% of them and you're wounding with, you know, another 50%. You know, you're still killing off a bunch of boats and your opponent's not going to be using luck of the laughing gods to re-roll a bunch of dice to protect them for one damage. So you're definitely whittling away at their army with that. And I think that was a problem. And then also mortal wounds, they have the potential five up mortal wound shrug bubble, which could be like up to nine inches. So an 18 inch, um, uh, uh, nine inch radius. So, I mean, it's basically like an 18 inch bubble. You could put anything inside of it. And then now you have a five up shrug, but you know, if you have a bunch of Tyranids running up the board, dishing out like 20 mortal wounds in a turn or more, even if you five up shrug those, you're still taking like, you know, 12 or 13. So, you know, you have like a big 18 inch diameter bubble, but at the same time, you know, that five up shrug is going to protect you, but it's not going to be like game breaking uh, protection. 
So I think that honestly we'll see how the meta shifts. I hope they don't go overboard. Uh, let me know what you think down below. Let me know what you think of my ideas or the community's ideas uh, you know, on the channel and people discussing in the comments uh, would do to fix the Harlequins. Do you think potentially like a 90 point increase in the army and then taking away the no rerolls and making that a strat for one or two is enough to fix them? You think it has to be 10 for the boat and then five for the gun? Do you think it has to be five for the gun or five for the boat and 10 for the gun? You think the transports need to go up too? I'm definitely curious. So technically right now, as we sit, the troop have just gained core keyword. So actually Harlequins are better. But I do expect that in the next day or two, uh, we're going to get that uh, we're going to get that balanced status slate, and that's going to change things. And hopefully they roll back a bunch of the nerfs on other armies and the point increases, and then all of a sudden we kind of see a little more balance. I have a feeling that that would really help the state of the game. So uh, let me know what you down, think down below. Always appreciate your guys' comments and feedback and everything, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up there. If you do enjoy this kind of speculation, rules, updates, news, all kinds of, uh, you know, painting tutorials, modeling tutorials, seeing commissions as they go out of the studio, uh, please do support the channel. Uh, basically, you know, really helps out, costs you nothing, and uh, definitely benefits me quite a bit. So uh, you'll have my personal thanks for that. And then also, uh, you know, really helps out. So uh, that being said, going to go ahead and wrap it up there. Uh, if you do enjoy the Warhammer 40,000, Kill Team Necromunda, Age of Sigmar, and Warcry content, as well as Horus Heresy, you know, Underworlds, pretty much anything to do with Games Workshop or even some D&D, &D, make sure to like and subscribe. That being said, Warhammer Man Studios, I'm Warhammer Man, and I'm out of here.